These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for thy, their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. And may the Lord hand his blessing to the reading of the entire chapter, 17th chapter of St. John's Gospel. Thank God you. bless you, Brother Brown. Lord bless you, Brother Neville. <laughs> I'm just like Brother Neville. I got just couldn't wait to Christmas to open up that present. And, uh, you know, once the man and twice the child is... <laughs> But I certainly think Brother Neville looks real nice in his new suit. Amen. 
And I got one of the prettiest overcoats I ever seen in my life from this church down here, and I certainly appreciate it. I thank you for your judging me a little bit bigger than what I really am, but I believe they'll get me one just a little bit smaller tomorrow. It's just a little bit too much coat for all the man it is to cover. So you heard in the, the Bible where the blanket was too short for the man or the bed. So it's just about almost that way with with this year with me because I the the coat was just a little large, but it's certainly pretty, and I hope they got one there just about one number smaller that'll fit me real good. And uh, I'll wear it out too to show it like he did there. <laughs> I have seen the time where I preached with the overcoat on. All right, glad to have it on. <laughs> well, I haven't had a good overcoat all my life. This is the first time I ever owned a good overcoat. I just wonder if this church can remember my first going away from this church. You remember what it was that night when I went to St. Louis in this church to visit Robert Darty's daughter. Uh, sister and brother Spencer, I guess, can remember it. Brother Roy Slaughter here, and many of them who I didn't even have any coat at all. And the church made up $11 for my ticket. And I borrowed my brother's overcoat, and it was just about twice too big for me. And I packed it because it looked so bad for me to wear it, and then I looked bad not to have any at all, so I, I packed it, and when I got over there, was there a couple days, and the Lord began to move and heal little Betty. You know, I seen her not long ago. She's a beautiful young woman now. She had sand fight as a dance and was just laying like an animal jerking back and forth for days and days and the best of doctors to give her up. I stayed that day and that evening. The Lord showed a vision just on what to do and said little Betty would be delivered as soon as they did that. I told the minister and his father to stand. I said to the lady, you was in the city the other day buying little pans and you bought one. It's a blue granite pan. It's sitting in your cabinets down beneath. You've never moved it since you put it in there. She started. She said, that's right. I said, go get it and fill it with water and bring a little white towel and come here for thus saith the Lord. Little Betty will be healed. Brother, and, uh, I'd just like to say one word to you, all right? Yes, go ahead. You know, when you was out there, you remember that, that I called you and our girl was sick and uh, you called your wife and tell her, well, at first I called you and left a message. And all right, five doctors said I didn't know what was the matter with Dorothy. Yes. And when you come in, you said, uh, there's a call from Brother Sawyer. <laughs> and you said, that's one of the best friends that I've got or something like that. Yes, sir. And you went up and prayed and you went and called your wife. And you said, uh, call us and tell them the girl will be all right. And she didn't know it was sick, you see. Yes. And, uh, and so uh, she... Uh, when next day she's hospital, the doctors come in and said that something is tough, something is tough was happening. She says yes, and they begin to kind of go over maybe what they've done. She said no. She said it was the prayers of Brother Bannon. Yes, I remember that. I feel that they didn't know what the matter was by a doctor. So that was the time. But when I came, I came out of the field to call you, and the wife was sending a child to me to call you. She was a yes. doctor. It was called Brother Bannon. So just a coincidence, we met in the field, and then when I called you, then you had prayer, and you called back, and you said, tell us, girl, go ahead and she it. Yes. Yeah, Honey, I guess you remember that, don't you? When we was in St. Louis in the, in the meeting, and uh, Brother Slaughter's little girl took real sick, and we was at the old Belcher Bath Hotel. I can remember that just so well. And we took the message and went before the Lord, and he showed the vision, said, and I called Brother Slaughter down, called him and said, tell him, thus saith the Lord, don't worry, she'll live. And she did. The Lord was so good. And lots of things happened since then. But he's still the same Lord Jesus. Isn't he? So marvelous. I just can't think of anything better than to know that that if I was going to inherit every penny of money the world owned and go to live for a thousand years here on earth, I'd rather know just what I have right now. Eternal life. 
Everlasting life will end after a bit. Eternal life has no end because it had no beginning. And so we're grateful for that. Brother <clears throat> Neville has just read some scriptures that he read for me out of the book of St. John. And there was one scripture there, the 21st verse. I'd like to call your attention to it just for a moment. Jesus in his prayer prayed this, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And if I should call it a text, I'd like to say this. The unity of one God in the one church. You know, God has made man to, to achieve. That's what man was made for. And all down through life, he has tried to achieve something. And his achievements... The reason he tries that is because he was so designed to do so. God made him that way. But the trouble of it is, in his achievement, he tries to do something within himself. There's where he makes his mistake and he gets in trouble. Now, in the beginning, Genesis, which is the seed chapter of the Bible... We find in there that when God made a man, he made him in the way that he knew that he was to be. And he could never be any greater design than what he is. When he began to make life, he made it from the lowest life, which is uh, more or less the polywog, the frog, and on to the highest life is man, which is in the image of God. And then in this life, Man began to achieve things. But when he did, he began to leave God out of the picture. He began to have selfish motives. And, and when he did that, he began to think of something for himself. And we find that it isn't long until he had corrupted the very planet that God had put him on. He had got it in such a condition till even his creator grieved him at his heart that he had ever made a man. And you can imagine how God felt when he seen the very creature that he made in his image and give him dominion and how that he made him to do something for him and yet he turned all of his strengths and his power over to his selfish desires and achievements. And then we find it isn't too long after this great lesson that God taught to man doing that time by destroying the entire world with water, as the Bible tells us. That he flooded the earth and destroyed everything but a remnant that he left, which was Noah and his family. And just immediately after he come out from that great lesson... It just seems like that man can't learn only through the hard way. We find that even in our children. We have to punish them many times severely to make them understand. It just seems like that a man is just in himself a total failure to begin with. When he lost his relationship with God, he become a unit of his own. He didn't depend on God no more. And when God had taught him the lesson of what it was to try to do something within himself that his works would all come to naught, immediately we find him again, going right down to achieve again. And the Bible said that they built them a tower. And they were going to climb up into the heavens to get up into heaven without coming the way God had planned for them to come. And man can achieve better when they're united together. 
Now you take one man by himself, his power is limited to one man. Two man makes him twice his strength. Four man makes him four times his strength. And God wants us to be one. God made man that we should be one. And our motives should be one. And our objectives should be one. And our, our achievements should be one. He is just designed that way. And we find out that immediately after the Antiluvian destruction, that man began to try to take over again himself. And all the time these things are going on, the spirit of the living God is striving with flesh. Trying to get man away from his own achievement. Trying to get man away from his own selfish motives and objectives to a plan which God has laid down. And as long as man works in his own plan, he will be a failure. And a man can only achieve right when he comes back with the right objective and the right motive. That is according to God's plan for him. And the other foundation is on sinking sand. And we find out then that they tried to unite and they begin come one person. But in this uniting they did that time, it was under a political power. Man became one. Their objective was one. Their achievements was one. But it was the wrong kind of one. Because it was against the plan of God. But he continued to go on. And finally when you find unity amongst people like that, they do great things. Just look over the world today when people unify themselves together, yet under the wrong plan, they'll do great things. Now they built a tower which I doubt that modern science could build today with all their machineries and things. Because they were united together. They had one mind, one soul, one purpose, one motive, one objective. That's build a tower so high that if God ever took a notion to destroy him again, they'd run right up into the heavens with him. And there'd be no way that... They could keep him from doing it. Or he, he could keep them from doing it as they thought. And we find out then that they organize themselves together and we find them again completely out of the will of God. And if that isn't a beautiful picture of this day, that when men are trying to unite together, and we should be united, but they're uniting under the wrong system. Did you ever notice how the devil patterns off the things of God? Did you ever see that how he takes the things that God has purposed and so deceiving is the wrong thing? Now, a lie, if it's just right out of real lie, then anyone can detect it. But that lie that's got about 99% truth in it, that's the one that's deceiving. Did you notice how that the devil deceived Eve? Everything he told her was exactly the truth, but one thing. Said, your eyes will be open and you shall know right and wrong and, and so forth and you shall be as gods because... You don't know right from wrong now. And all those things were true. But when she said, the Lord God said we would die, he said, surely you won't die. See, just so much truth in it. And then just a little bit of lie, as Jesus said on the earth, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. And it's got to be perfectly right or it isn't right at all. And the plan of salvation has got to be exact and God's promises are exact and they work exact or there, there something is wrong somewhere. 
And if the church of the living God is not achieving what God purposed for them to do, there's something wrong with that system somewhere. Just got to be. You take a fine piece of machinery like a watch and let every piece of that machinery work in harmony and it'll keep perfect time. But when one piece gets one way and one another, it won't keep time. No matter how good the jewels are, it's all got to be unified together. That's God's purpose for us to unify together and be one. But we find out there that how the devil patterns things. All unrighteousness is only righteousness perverted. A lie is only the truth turned around. Uh, Good things that God does, wrong things, is good things perverted. So therefore that unrighteousness is righteousness perverted. Satan cannot create anything himself. He only has to take what God has created to pervert it. Man living with his wife is absolutely right. But take that another woman that the same act is perverted and it's death. One brings life, the other brings death. That's the way that all, all the things that Satan has got in his reach is just taking what God has made and changing it around. Did you ever think of the Mohammed religion? At the grave of Mohammed has been a white horse saddled for 2,000 years. Every four hours, the guard changes and another white horse is brought out. And they do that reverently and with constant belief that Mohammed will rise someday and ride the world down. They believe it. And did you ever think, why the white horse? Did you know the scripture says that Jesus shall come riding on a white horse? And his vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. It's the Lord Jesus shall come riding in the heavens with the armies behind him riding on a white horse. Can you see that perverted religion turn around and make it Mohammedan on a white horse? But Jesus is coming in the heavens. Mohammed is earthly. So Satan works with the earth thing while God works with the heavens. And did you ever think of the Tower of Babylon and compare it with Jacob's Ladder? How that they were trying to build stair steps around the tower that would reach up into heaven. Only trying to pervert Jacob's ladder which reached from the heavens to the earth and angels descending and ascending. Perverting it. Did you ever think of the UN now? Trying to make all the nations one great big brotherhood under a united power. United is all right, but it's under the wrong thing. Satan controls all the nations. The scripture says that Satan is the ruler of the earth. When he taken Jesus up into a high exceeding mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and he said, these are mine. Jesus did not say they wasn't, for they are. That's the reason we have wars and killings is because that these kingdoms of the world are controlled by the devil. And as long as they are controlled by the devil... We'll continue to have wars and fights and killing one another. But we look for a kingdom to come 
where Christ shall come and there will be no more wars. And there will be an everlasting peace. Did you think that in this Russia they have got a false Pentecost? They are, that's the work of the devil. They are trying to force all men into communism. Where every man has everything commonly. Do you know that was the condition of the church under the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? That the people sold their possessions and laid them at the feet of the disciples and they distributed them to every man as they had need. And now the devil's come around and got into the world and made a political power to force man to that. God does not force man to do anything. Amen. You do it on your own free will. He can warn you. Throw a barricade across your path. But you walk your own self with your own decision in His presence to make Him your Savior. But Satan has perverted God's plans to his own plan. Did you ever think of Catholicism in the Catholic Church is trying to make every person Catholic? It won't work. It's under a man-made program. Did you ever think of the Protestant church under the Federation of Churches is trying to force all these little churches out? And it will happen that you'll not be able to go to church unless you belong to the union of churches. Then little places like this will certainly pay for it. But we got a scripture that says... Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. Amen. That's what we look forward to. Then you see it's all the achievement of the enemy tries to do to achieve, but it's under the wrong plan. It's under his own plans. But he has no original he has to take something that God has did and then pervert it into unrighteousness to do it. Today they're trying to pervert the world or convert it into one great big union of, of nations, a brotherhood. And if it would be under a man-made disguise, but it would have a leader and it would be the devil. Because he's the leader of all of them. God's kingdom is not of this earth. Amen. God's kingdom is in our hearts. It's the spiritual kingdom that we're born Amen. into it. Praise God. Jesus said, the kingdom of God comes, but not without violence. And the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. The Holy Spirit, God's kingdom moving in and the man in governing and controlling him. Amen. That's the kingdom. And we find that these nations go about deceiving one another, talking peace with a knife behind them. Just ready to destroy each other. A few days ago, I had the privilege of talking to a, a chaplain. That's a great man. And in California, they had the scientists, some of the best that we got in the nations had met there for a gathering. And to, to have a secret closed meeting and be in it, it was so terrible. They called a chaplain in with them. And this chaplain friend of mine said, Brother Branham, before I could be taken in, they searched my record to my great-grandmother. Before I could go in this meeting. And he said, I wish I had not been there. He said, when those scientists got up and began to speak, he said, it seemed there was a gloom settled over the room that made you feel like is in an ice house. Chills. How it would curdle the blood of a man. 
said, they, we're not allowed to talk of these things. We're sworn under oath. But said, I am allowed to tell you this. He said, they're fixing to do away with the army, with the aviation, the aviator corps and so forth. Said, they don't need them no more. He said, they've got weapons so deadly that they could destroy the whole earth in one second's time. And said, if they would let that be known, that people would go panically and go into the streets screaming to the top of their voice. Said, they've got a bomb that would drop on the earth. Just one bomb would blow 175 miles around them over 100 feet deep. Where could you go to hide? What if you dug a thousand feet you couldn't? You'd go into the volcanic eruption of the earth. But if you could dig a thousand feet under the earth, a concussion like that hitting on top of you would smash you into powder. Said this one great scientist got up and he was the top scientist of the army. He said, gentlemen, I wish I could take an old cow in a wagon drive over behind the mountains and forget all about it. Serve my little time on earth and leave. He said, but we've got to face it. Driving behind the mountain won't do any good. He said, those mountains would become nothing but powder or volcanic ashes. Oh, brother, it pays to know where you got an escape in them times. We've got an escape. We've got a shelter that shelters under the wings of the Lord's everlasting protection. Knowing this, that you have an immortal soul that cannot die, that's not made with atoms, or with hydrogen, or with oxygen, or with anything that's on this earth. It's made by a spirit that God Almighty created Himself. And give to you. What a day that we are living. What a time that where man has achieved and achieved until he's achieved himself these things. Now what shall he do with them? You see, Satan uses a man's head. He chose that in the Garden of Eden. To take a man's head, his thinking. And he has brought that down even to the church. See, the devil takes a man's head so he can use his eye. And if you'll notice, if the man isn't genuinely born again spiritual, he'll take what he can see with his eyes. The pride of life. And he'll go many men to say he's going to, to achieve something. He wants to join church. He wants to be religious. And he'll look around till he can find the biggest church he can find. Because man wants to do something big. He wants to make a big name for himself. That's what carnal, foolish, stinking man thinks. Oh, if I can have my organization... If I can only add so many thousands to my denomination, it'll be the largest then in the land of its kind. What good does that do? But he thinks he's achieving something because he's adding more. I believe it was some years ago in 1944 that the Baptists had a a slogan out, a million more in 44. What did they have when they got a million more? Just like joining a lodge if they wasn't genuine, born again disciples of Christ. Amen. They were just Baptists by name. Look at the other denominations the Lutheran, the Presbyterian, the Pentecostals, 
All the other denominations. They're the same. They're trying to achieve something. They want to do something great. See, because it's his eye he's looking at. He thinks with his eye. And many times he don't understand that that's the thing that he ought to do. Amen. But the devil takes the man's eye. He shows him something pretty. He opens his eyes to look at it. And he's got that into the church, into the intellectual thinking of man. Some time ago, this great evangelist, Billy Graham, stood here in Louisville and held up his Bible. He said, this is God's standard. And he's right. Amen. He's exactly right. Mordecai Ham, the evangelist of old Kentucky home, and I were sitting at the same table which... Billy was converted under Mordecai Ham. And we were sitting there. And he said, what happens? He said, Paul went into a city and got one convert. He returned a year later and he had 30 of that one. Said, I go into a city and I have 20,000 converts. Return in a year and can't find 20. Something's wrong. And he said, you know what it is? It's you lazy preachers. That sit in the buildings, your offices with your feet on the desk and don't go visit the people. I thought, Billy, that's a very good intellectual. Please don't quote me. But that isn't it. Who was the pastors that went to that one that Paul got converted? It wasn't that. It's your... Those so-called meetings today, and they are great meetings, but it only works on the intellectual part of man. A man gets under the spell of a revival, and he says, yes, I accept Christ. And he does it intellectually because he's in a great crowd. He does it because there's great ministers before him. But it's only an intellectual conception. That man can never go on. He's got to come from his mind to his heart and be born again. Or he'll never be able to stand the test. Amen. Intellectual conceptions is all right. But when you remember, when the eye looks up on it, the devil uses your eye. In the Garden of Eden, it proved that the devil chose the head of man to work in. But God chooses his heart. The devil shows him with his eyes something that he can see. And he says, seeing is believing. But when God comes to a man, he comes to his heart. And he lets him believe things by his heart through faith that his eyes does not see. For the scripture says that the faith is the substance of things. Hope for the evidence of things not seen. God working here, Satan working here. So what good does these big schools and seminaries do anyhow? It's sometimes, not always. But too many times it pulls from here up to here. When it ought to be taken from here down to here. In the man's heart. You know the scripture says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The old infidel and critic used to say how foolish God was. To say that there was mental faculties in a man's heart. For there's nothing in there to think with. But about four years ago, science found out that in the human heart there is a thinking faculty. There is a little room. A little place where there's not even a cell. A little compartment in the human heart. It isn't in the animal or no other life. But in the human heart, there is a little place. And they never could come to conclusion what it was. But finally they said this, it's the place where the soul dwells. So God does speak his words right. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is it. Not in his head. If God would have meant head, he'd have said head. 
He said his heart. Amen. What if Moses, when he come up, and Moses, God said, take off your shoes, Moses. You're on holy ground. What if Moses said, now, wait a minute, Lord, I, I know you meant my hat. I'll just take off my hat. That's more reverent. He never said hat. He said shoes. Amen. That's what he meant. He never meant shake hands and join the church. He said, you must be born again. Amen. That Amen. from above. Not put your name on a book, but be regenerated. Amen. And your soul changed. Amen. Your entire being made new again. Now, when man is, has never had that experience, he's still a son of God in creation. A fallen son of God. That's the reason he can take wood and make buildings. He can take iron and make machinery. He can take jewels and make watches. What can he do? He can take something that's out of the original creation and pervert it from its original stand to make something great. But he cannot create. Only God can create. Him alone. And we notice in this stand... That Satan choosing the man's head. He took his intellectual part. And now the churches begin to move in the intellectual parts of a man. Oh, it's a great church. We have a great denomination. We're the oldest in the country. But brother, until that man or woman or boy or girl is thoroughly converted. Amen. He'll take them intellectual conceptions and say the Bible don't mean this and it don't mean that. The days of miracles is past and there is no such a thing as these other things. There, that, that's not right, he say. And the days is past because he's intellectually looking at it. But let that same man take what little knowledge he has in his head and give it over to God. Let the Spirit of the living God come down into Amen. that heart of His. He'll call every word of God the truth. Amen. And ever promise divine. Praise the Lord. Then He can achieve for God. You see that little part compartment in a man's heart? God made that in there for Himself. Amen. That's His control room. He sits there to control you. That's his place. That's where he sends his messages from the control room. How can he work with you when the nature of the spirit of the devil is in there? And every man born on earth is born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. That's right. So in that carnal, Adamic nature, how can a man achieve anything only go through his intellectuals? But when he comes to be a new creature and the old man has passed out and the new man, Christ, takes his throne in the human heart, Amen. then life looks different. Then he starts on a new road from his own selfish motives to the big ideas to make himself something big. He starts right towards Calvary to recognize God. Then his all is his objective, his motive, his achievement, and all that he is lays in the glory of the cross. For Christ paid the price for human life. Christ is our life. That's why Jesus said, except a man be born again, he can't even understand the kingdom of God. You can't do it. It's not in you to do it. Then... Why did God make that little place? He made it so you could be filled in there. You've got to be filled with something. You can't be a human being without being filled. The time has come where you're forced to make a decision. And that's now. Because it's forced all over the earth. I've heard ministers get up with charts and try to explain what the mark of the beast was. But some kind of a chart. It doesn't take a chart. The scripture says all that didn't receive the seal of God had the mark of the beast. There's only two classes on the earth. One's got the mark of God. The other's got the mark of the devil. And all that didn't receive the mark of God had the mark of the devil. 
That's what the scripture said. So you're forced to make a decision. Let me grind it into you not to be rude or, or mean, but to tell you the truth and warn you. Man's got to do something about it. It's, you're, it's forced onto you. You must make a decision. Then if I can show you by God's word what the seal of the living God is, then you'll know. The Bible said in Ephesians 4.30, once, many places throughout the scripture, that the Holy Spirit is the seal of God. Amen. Then without the Holy Spirit, you're marked on the other side. No matter how intellectual, how many denominations that you belong to, how pious and religious you are, Satan was the same thing. Satan's not some big brute with a fork and tail and fork and hoofs. He's a spirit. And the Bible said so cunning that he would deceive the very elected if possible. He's religious. Was not Cain just as religious as Abel was? Did not Cain offer an offering just the same as Abel did? Did not Cain build a church unto the Lord the same as Abel did? Did not Cain get down and worship just the same as Abel did? Did not Cain sacrifice just the same as Abel did? But one come by intellectual conception. He brought the flowers and the fruits of the field and made his altar beautiful. Intellectual. But Abel, by faith, chose a lamb for it was blood and life that taken it. And he drug him to a rock and hammered his little toe until he bled to death. God said, that's righteous, Abel. That's right. How did he come to him? By revelation, not by intellectual. Through his heart. He knew it. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail Amen. against me. Spiritual revelation. Spiritual conception. Man looks upon the outside, says the scripture. God looks on the heart. You are filled with something. You might be filled with doubt. Your poor hearts may be running over with doubt. I hope not. Your hearts may be full of frets and weary. And it might be that your hearts are full of trouble. And it might be that you're full of religion. Intellectual, fine, perfumed theology. Belonging to the great churches that's been in existence for years. Setting back just as confidence as you can be. Brother, let me say to you, you might bring members to that church until you get old and die. And you'll never do nothing but build another tower to Babel. Certainly, you can be full of foolishness. You can be full of nonsense. You can be full of anything, but you can't stay empty. The Bible says you can't. The Bible said when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walks in dry places, searching rest, and then he comes back with seven other devils more worse than he was. And the last, the state of that man is eight times worse than it was at the beginning. That's what happens to these meetings. When people go forth in revivals and men are just led to an intellectual conception, he goes off and joins some church and lets it go at that, satisfied, that's all right. There's nothing to all this other nonsense. We should not have it. The pastor says, oh, that's all. That was way back in another age. And the first thing you know, that devil returns back with seven other devils and he becomes a religious devil. Then he's really filled. Then he's got pride and jealousy and, and he's, he's even angry with the very God that wrote the Bible. He looks down there and says, These things that I do shall you also. That was for the disciples. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, said Jesus. His last commission to the church. These signs shall follow them that believe. How far? All the world. Who to every creature. These signs shall follow some of them. 
the scripture says, shall follow them, all of them Amen. that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. If they shall take up serpents or drink deadly things, it shall not harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Amen. That's what Jesus said. These signs shall follow believers. Not negative thinkers. Not intellectual church members. But born again believers who's come from the intellectual to the heart where God takes throne in His control room. Amen. To control your emotions. To control your faith. To control your character. God wants to fill you. Why does He want to fill you? What does He want to fill you with? He wants to fill you with Himself, the Holy Spirit. Fill with the Holy Ghost. Jesus said in Luke 24, 49, that you shall receive power after this the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Then you'll be witness of me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria unto the utmost parts of the earth. Amen. When? When you have received your doctor's degree. When you have seen your received the Bachelor of Art. No. But when you have received the Holy Ghost, then you'll be witnesses to me through this generation, the generations that are to come, and to the utmost parts of the earth. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost came from heaven like a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting, signs and wonders were wrought among them. And the intellectual said, Man, brethren, what can we do to be saved? Peter said, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to them it's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's what God wants you to feel with. He wants you Fill with the Holy Ghost. And then you'll be united. What to? A church. No, sir. You'll be united. What to? A creed. No, sir. You'll be united to God and you and Him will be one as Amen. Him. The Father is one. God's Holy Spirit will live in you in the same works that the Holy Spirit performed Amen. when it was shared in the Christ. Jesus shall be performed in you for He said He would do it. Then we are one. Jesus prayed for that. In the prayer tonight, our heavenly Master, pray to the Father that we'd be one as He and God is one. And how close were they? God was the life and spirit in Him. And if we are one with Him, we will be life and spirit of Him will be in us. The earthly, carnal, intellectual conception and creeds and dogmas will fade out and a new generated, born again, virgin experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit will take place in the human heart. Then you'll be one. Then brother will really be brother. Sister will be sister. Your objectives and your motives and all that you are and all that you ever want to be or try to be will be for the kingdom of God. God. No matter what church you represent, where you go or what you do. There are so many people today who says that the Holy Spirit is not real today. While tens of thousands of them and millions are saying it's not so, there's that many enjoying the blessings of it. Amen. Mostly are poor people. People who's been dejected and rejected by the world. People who's been thrown out of churches because that they believe God to be God. But they have been filled with this spirit. They are one in purpose. They're one heart. Who are those people? Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Jehovah, Witness, Orthodox Jew. All together they become one. Not one to a creed. Not one to a denomination. That's the working of the devil through intellectual conceptions. But the working of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God in you. God sits on the throne of your heart in His control room, controlling your emotions and controlling your powers, controlling your conceptions, 
and making you one with Him. Amen. And fellowship and in love. And God fills you with love. He fills you with power. He fills you with the Spirit. He fills you with His own divine nature. And He changes your carnal nature into His nature. Then in this, you become a new creation in Christ. Then the love, you go out. Seemingly the birds sing different. Oh, how different it is when Christ comes. How you can look back and think, how did I ever stay away from it? How did I ever reject it? Everything's different. You have no enemies. They all look sweet. You can forgive everything that's ever been done. The bitterest of enemy, you could pray for him on the street. Put your arm around him and lift him up. No matter what creed, what denomination he belongs to, he's a creature who Christ died for. That's what God wants you to fill with. That's the filling. That's the kingdom. That's what we're one in. We're one then not to, not to further a denomination, not to further a cult or, or some creed. We're one to further the kingdom of God. Amen. Then we take his blueprint and every time the blessed Bible says anything, the Holy Spirit in you cries out, It's so! It's my word! Amen. You don't say, Did Dr. Jones say what about this? Or did Dr. so-and-so? It makes no difference what doctor said so. Jesus said it's the truth. And heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. That's when we are you on. All you Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, who are, whoever you are, we're one. Don't let the devil use your eye. Let God use your heart. If you look and try to understand what it is, what makes it, how does it come that way, you don't question that when you receive the Holy Spirit. If you're still questioning the Word of God, it shows that God's not in your heart. The Holy Spirit doesn't question one thing God says. It says, Amen and Amen. So, because God said so. Abraham called those things which were not as though they were because God said so. God told him at 75 years old and Sarah at 65 that he's going to have a baby. Why, well, it was ridiculous to think so. But God said so and Abraham was a son of God. And he walked 25 years calling to everything. Every day Sarah would say, how are you, dear? Don't feel any difference than I ever did. She is 40 years past menopause. Never had children when she's living with him when she's 17 years old. But he believed God and called everything contrary to it as though it wasn't. Amen. And he called God's word the truth. Amen. First month passed. How you feel, Sarah? No different. Well, he says, pray God we'll have the baby anyhow. Amen. A year passed. How you feel? No different, but we'll have it anyhow. Amen. And the Bible said instead of getting weaker, he got stronger all the time. Amen. It'd be more of a miracle. God said so. It has to happen. Twenty-five years and now she's ninety and he's a hundred. One day an angel come down. Had his back turned to the tent. And he said, Abraham, I'm going to visit you. And he told Abraham what was going to happen. And little Isaac was born. Why? Because Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strong giving praise to God. Why? It wasn't in his mind. It was in his heart. God's throne is in the human heart. There we become one. One in purpose. One in achievement. If the Methodist brother wins a hundred souls to God, amen and amen. If the Presbyterian, whatever he might be, wins a soul to Christ, amen and amen. If Tommy Osborne wins a million souls this year, and Oral Roberts a million souls, and Billy Graham a million souls, and every other denomination a million souls, I can stand and praise the living God. Because that's what we're achieving. The kingdom of God, that's what our, our objective is to do, to send souls to Him. They're born again Christians. That's when we're one. We're united together. We're brethren. Not as long as you say, well, they're not Methodists, they're not Baptists, they're not this, that, or the other. Then your, uh, your whole motive is wrong. And your objective and all you achieve is wrong. When you're trying to do something within yourself to make it look big. When you're little. Remember, did you ever notice wheat growing? If you see wheat stand up and shaking itself like that, remember there's no head in it. It's empty. 
A full head always bows. And a man is full and filled with God's goodness and His mercy. He bows his head in humility. Amen. He that will humble himself, God will exalt. He that exalts himself shall be made a base. Friends, it's time that men and women woke up to the fact that we want to be one. Jesus prayed that we might be one just as God and Him were one and God was in Him. And we are one with Christ if we let Christ come in. But the only way we can do is to let Him take the control room in our heart. Then we become one. Amen. We're facing Christmas. We're facing times. We're facing a horrible things. All this that we're facing, what difference does it make? What comes or goes as long as Christ is in the control room? Controlling us. Controlling us and giving us faith to believe. Things that we cannot see. God said we faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. You believe it. For God is in your heart and telling you that His Word's right. And no spirit will, of God will ever deny anything of God's Word. The Spirit of God will recognize His own. Oh, how happy I am to know that there is a God that is real. Some time ago, there was a, up here in Indiana, there was two boys that was raised out on a farm. And they were just as poor as poor could be farmer boys. And they grew up together and one day one of them got married and a few days afterwards, the other one got married, and one of them went into the city to live. And he had begun to play the stock markets, got away from his childhood teaching, went into the wrong thing. And he played them, and he got richer and richer, to finally he become a malted millionaire. And he moved up into Chicago, got on one of the great streets and built himself a palace. Him and his wife run to nightclubs and they drink cocktails and they laid out all night. They had butlers and everything to furnish them anything that they wanted. They thought they were really living. But a man that lives like that has no peace. There is no peace to a troubled heart. To a sinful heart there cannot be peace. If a man longs to drink and he calls that life, he thinks he's having a big time. It shows his emptiness. Take a man, make a million dollars. He wants two. Take a man that goes to a party and drinks one drink tonight. He wants another. Take a man lives untrue to his wife once he will live it again. Vice the versa. See, it's something and he's never satisfied. Might have a million dollars in his hands. Or ten million in his hands. He lays down at night with a drunken stew on him. He wakes up the next morning. Hold it! Nightmare! Trouble mind! You call that peace? That's no peace. But a man might not even have a pillar to press his head to. He might not even own a decent pair of shoes or able to have a decent meal in his house. But if God reigns in his heart, he goes to bed happy and wakes up happy. It's a lasting peace. It's something that God does. This fellow had forgot that teaching. He went to Gamma and it come Christmas time, he thought of his buddy. So he wrote him a letter. One of his name was Jim, the rich man, and John was the poor one. And he wrote him a letter and he said, John, I wish you'd come up to see me through the holidays. I'd like to meet you, talk with you again. I haven't seen you for many years. He wrote him back and said, I'd like to come, Jim, but I can't come. I haven't got the money to come. A check come in the mail in a few days said, come on, I want you to come anyhow. So John got ready, country boy, put on a good clean pair of overhauls, his Katie hat and a little coat of a different color, and boarded the train, and when he got there, there was a chauffeur sitting there to meet him with a big limousine. He didn't know how to act. He got in this limousine, holding his hat in his hand, looking around, drove up to a great palace in Chicago, got out, went up to the door and rung the bell, and out come a butler, said, your card, please, sir. He didn't know what he was talking to. He handed him his hat. He was, he didn't know nothing about no reception card. He didn't have much of this world's good. 
He said, I want your card. He said, I don't know what you're talking about, sir. He said, Jim sent for me to come. That's all I know. So he went back and told his partner who hadn't got out of bed yet. He said, there's a funny looking man standing at the door. He said, he's dressed. I've never seen a man dressed like him. And he said, Jim sent him. He said, tell him to come on in. He slipped on his bathrobe, went down the hall and met this old country friend of his and shook his hand. He said, John, you don't know how glad I am to see you. The old country fellow standing looking around in the room said, Jim, you sure have got plenty. He said, I want to show you around. He took him upstairs and out on the sun porch, opened up the window and said, where's Martha? Oh, said, she hasn't come in here. She was out last night. Said, I, are you all getting along? Said, oh, not much. John, how are you and Katie getting along? Said, just fine. Said, was she home? Said, yes, we got seven kids. Said, y'all got any children? Said, no, Martha wouldn't have any. Said, she thought we better not have any children. It interferes with the social life. The old raised back the curtains. He said, looky here. Said, you see that bank over yonder? He said, yes. Said, I'm the president in that bank. Said, you see that railroad company? Yes. Said, I've got a million dollars worth of shares in that. And he looked down there and he seen the great gardens and everything. How beautiful it looked. And old John stood there with his straw cat in his hand looking around. He said, that's fine, Jim. I sure thankful that you've got it. He said, me and Katie ain't got much. That We still live in that little old split shingle house down there. And said, we don't have very much, but we're awful happy. Just then, a bunch of carol singers, their voices begin to come in. Silent night, holy night, all is calm and all is bright. Round young virgin, mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild. Jim turned and looked at John. John looked up to Jim. Said, John, I want to ask you something. Said, you remember when we as boys, we used to go to that little old red church down there on the side of the road and we'd hear them old country choir sing them songs? Said, yes. Said, you still go down there? Said, yes, I still belong there, so I'm a deacon down there now. Said, what about you, Jim? Said, he's talking about how much you own down here. Said, how much do you own up this way? John, I'm sorry, said, I don't own nothing up that way. He said, you remember, just before Christmas one year, we didn't have any shoes. And said, we was more interested in getting some firecrackers for Christmas. And said, we went out and set some box traps to catch some rabbits to get some firecrackers for Christmas. Said, you remember that morning that big old woods rat was in that box trap of yours? John said, yes, I remember it. You get some firecrackers and you went and got some divided with me? He said, yes. He said, John, I'll divide anything I got with you, but one thing I wish you could divide to me. He said, I'd give everything I own if I could walk that little old dusty road barefooted up to that little old church again and feel that presence of the living God. When that choir was singing, the old-fashioned country preacher was preaching. He said, I'd give anything I'd give all that I own ever share in the railroad and all the parts of the bank in this home and all if I could turn back again and have that blessed peace that I had when I went up that old road. Amen. Old John Tuck put his arms around him. He said there was three wise men, rich men, who came and laid it all at the feet of Jesus one time as a baby and said they received pardoning of their sins. He said, I... Although I, I think it's your wonderful, Jim, and what you've been blessed to do all these things, but I'd rather have my wife and seven children living down their own straw ticks to sleep on than have the peace that's in my heart than to have all your riches, Jim, that you could have. And that's right, friends. Riches is not measured out by dollars. Riches is not measured out by big names and popularity. Riches is when the kingdom of God has come into the human heart changed his emotions and made him a new creature in Christ Jesus and gave him eternal life. That's the richest thing on earth. 
Let us pray. And while our heads is bowed, are you poor tonight in this world's goods? You don't even know how you're going to pay the coal bill or the oil bill or whatever more. You may be that way. I hope you're not. But if it's so that you are that way, you can leave this building tonight the happiest poor man there is on the earth. You can live here with, leave here tonight with riches that no money could ever buy. You can unite your heart with Christ Jesus and He can come into your soul and take the control room. And no matter what comes or goes, you'll be happy the rest of your days. It's the greatest present that was ever given. Oh, of course, you give your friends Christmas presents. That's good. That's tokens. But brother, there's a present offered you tonight that no money could ever buy. It's a free gift come from God, His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Would you receive Him as your personal guider, as your personal Savior, as your God, as your, as your Redeemer, as your King? He heals the soul and the body. He takes the control room. If you've got fears and doubts, just let it go now. Let Him be King. Let Him come in and take over. Let Him be Lord. Lord is ruler. Lordship is rulership. You say, well, I, I believe I opened my heart to Him years ago, but has He ever become your Lord? Completely controlled to control your emotions, your faith, and all. When you read the Bible, every word of it's the truth. When peace and frustrations come, you've got peace in your heart. Knowing if the atomic bomb should scatter this earth into bits tonight, you'd be gathered in Christ Jesus in glory before the ashes ever settled to the earth. Have you that consolation? If you have not and would like to have it, would you just quickly and silently raise up your hand and by doing so say, Lord, be merciful to me. I now want to be united with you as one of your children in the kingdom of God and my motives, my objectives. Uh, you know all about me. Take me, Lord, just as I am and let me become yours. God bless you, son. God bless you, sir. God bless you, 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 brother, you, you, you there, and you lady. God bless you. That's right. I know the old-fashioned type of the Methodist church and so forth believes in coming to the altar and so forth. That's all right. Brother, you can't raise your hand to God. You can't even make a move towards that unless God touches you. Amen. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father draws him first. Won't you honor and respect that which has made you raise your hand? Say, yes, Lord, I mean that from my heart. And every sin that I have, I lay now on your altar. I consecrate myself to you just now, Lord, that from this hour on, I live for you. And all my habits and all my sins and all I forsake right here, emptying out my heart, you be the principle of my heart. You be the Lord of my heart. Take your rightful place in my life, Lord, and control me. Mean that now while we pray. Lord, I have learned in thy word that it is written that no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And all that the Father has given me will come to me. Man may live ten years, twenty, fifty, or a 75 years or even more and yet has never come but there will come a time that when the light will flash across his path and that's the opportunity how thankful we are that there is still there is still a God who loves people and tonight he's displayed his mercy to us by letting many hands be raised up to accept Jesus as this God's great Christmas gift the original and the only real, true, God-sent Christmas gift is His only begotten Son to the earth. Receive them, Lord. There will come a day that when they'll press a dying pillow or groaning on the road under an automobile or maybe gurgling in their throats from drowning in a water. I do not know what their destination will be. But Lord, I know this, that Jesus said these words he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Amen. I believe that to be your word, Lord. 
Whether I live or die, it's still your word. For you have spoken in all heavens and earth. will pass away, but your word shall never fail. You said, He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. I'll give him everlasting life and will raise him up at the last days. Though he drowns in the sea, though he burns in the fire, though his ashes are blown to the four winds of the earth, the Lord God shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel Amen. and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. We shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air and forever be with him. Lord God, we believe that that will take place. And all these poor, rejected people of the earth that's come in here tonight and bowed their heads towards the dust where you take them from and where they will return if you tarry. They've raised their hands, their hands to you and said, Lord, I'm wrong. Receive me. Oh, how would you turn one down? You could not. You could not do it, Lord. If they meant that from the depths of their heart, you could not do it and remain God because they've come sincerely. They're a love gift that the Father is giving you. Now as your servant, I command them to thee and commit their souls and their bodies and their spirits unto thee. Hold them in thy blessed keeping, Lord. Take all the evil out of them. Take the sin, take the habits. May it never bother them from this night on. May they go from here free people with God in their hearts, in the control room. And when the enemy shall tempt them, let them remember God's in the control room. Amen. He's the one who turns their head from the enemy. And we'll establish thy kingdom, Lord, and thy kingdom come, thine Amen. will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So it is written, so let it be done. Amen. Everyone who raised their hands and believed that the Lord Jesus Christ, accepting Him as your Savior, taking from your heart by faith, not what your eyes tell you, what your mind thinks you, I can't quit it, I can't do it, I can't stop doing this, that's intellectual. Amen. But something down in your heart says, and you are my property. Remember, Amen. listen to what your voice in the heart says, because it's God speaking to you. Amen. All other things will fade just like, like the night has to fade. Which is the strongest, the night or the day? Let the sun rise and see what happens to the night. It just fades and can be no more. And when, when the Spirit of God comes into a man's heart, all of his intellectuals just fade in the darkness and doubts just goes away, and you can't find it anymore. Because there's no room for it. Life has filled his soul. He walks in the light. He is in the light. He's a child of God. God loves him. Amen. Now, I'd like to sing a hymn, all of us together. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King. With Jesus, my Savior, I'm the child of a king. How many feels that way now? Raise up your hands. I'm the child of a king. You that Ray had your hands up a while ago, put them up. Believe it. Stay with it. God knows your heart. Come, Pastor. I um, can't lead songs, but let's sing that song you helped me, will you? All of you together now, all right, as we sing this. All right. I believe our sister's coming over with the, yeah. uh, to give us a card on the music. Uh, looked around, I didn't see her anywhere, and that's Amen. the reason I said that. My How many knows? My father is rich house with houses and land. He holds the wealth, wealth of the world, world in his hand. Just think of how beautiful that is. All right. Everyone now together. My father is rich. He will have his hand laid. He holds the wealth of the world in his hand. Yeah.
child of the king, a child of the king, with Jesus my Savior, I'm the child of the king. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? You believe you're a child of the king? Raise your hand, all who believe that you're children of the king. All right? Now, while we sing that again, I want you to shake hands with somebody behind you, someone in front of you, someone to right and left. No matter what they are, what belief you have, if you're a child of the king, while we sing it again. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king, with Why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there of rubies and diamonds of silver and gold. His colors are full. He has riches. Since then I've been on the battlefield doing all that I know how to lead men and women to look to that crown of glory. Amen. You go to speaking about the coming of the Lord. People said, a man said to me not long ago, Oh, preacher, don't talk like that. I said, are you a Christian? Yes, but I, my, we got a lot to do yet. I said, the happiest thing I can think of is the coming of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Paul said at the end of the road, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. The Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not only me, but all those who love his appearance. Amen. Uh, what could I trade? What have I got too far? I'm getting old. This old, frail, sickly body that's full of corruption will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I'll be young forever. I'll never have a sick spell again. I'll never cry a tear. I'll never, never get old. I'll never die. I'll never Amen. be sick. I'll never have a heartache or a weary. But I'll have a body like his own glorious body. If I thought that ain't something to live for, if that isn't the greatest thing that I know, how do I get it? It's a free gift. Hallelujah. God knocks. And I say, yeah, Lord, you're my creator. I accept you. He seals me in with the Holy Spirit into him. Amen. Then I see nothing but Jesus and his blood. What can wash away my sin? 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Aren't you happy? I know no creed can do it. I know no denominations can do it. I know no church can do it. I know no man can do it. I know no water can do it. I know no theology can do it. Amen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. My hopes is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood with righteousness. All around my soul gives away. Then he's all my hope and stay. Is that you? Amen. For on Christ the solid rock we stand, all other grounds is sinking sands. All other grounds is sinking sands. God bless you now. I believe there's a dedication of a baby. Yes. I believe so at this time. I'll turn the service to the pastor for this. Come right ahead, Brother Neville. The Lord bless you.